Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're gonna to talk about piston wall clearance in this Honda B20. In the last video, we did all the bottom end bearing clearances, and now it's time to move a little bit further up the engine, do piston wall clearance, talk about the relationship between the piston and the cylinder wall, the rings in the cylinder wall, and how you'll be kind of going over those parts as the engine comes together. We're checking piston wall clearance because it's a critical part of the engine's operation. If the bore is too large for the piston, or piston too large for the bore, we get into a situation where metal will be transferred from the piston onto the bore and vice versa, and the engine will be a very short-lived program. So you have to account for a certain amount of expansion as all these components come up to operating temperature, and there has to be enough clearance for oil to be between all these moving parts so they're not transferring material. If the piston wall clearance is too big, then you're gonna have a situation where you'll have the piston rocking in the bore, so it's gonna have noise. So that's gonna be piston slap or the pistons knocking in the engine. And while it's moving that piston back and forth in the bore, you're uncovering the rings. The rings have a certain face shape to them and the piston needs to be stable in order for that ring to be stable in the bore. So when the piston rolls over in the bore, you can uncover the ring and create a situation where you have excessive blow by or smoking. So there needs to be clearance between the piston and the bore in order for the right amount of oil to be on the bore, keeping the piston lubricated, keeping the rings cooled and lubricated and keeping the rings sealing. Because remember, the engine is going to use a certain amount of oil on that bore to create a seal. The piston and the ring are gliding on a thin coat of oil that's creating a seal and the ring does not work in a metal on metal condition, it's working on oil. So the piston wall clearance is a critical value that you wanna have correct in order for all that relationship to work well. Now, if you're dealing with an engine that has a lot of boost or a lot of nitrous, or you're gonna run the engine with the engine block cold, like a drag racing situation, you may opt for more than the minimum piston wall clearance. So there's a window of operation. Most manufacturers will give a minimum clearance because that's what they know will keep that piston from sticking in the bore when the engine's cold or when the piston is hot. So you wanna follow the minimum requirement, but keep in mind if your engine's gonna be operated in a race only situation, you may opt for more than the minimum clearance required. Somewhere around 5,000 piston wall clearance on an 85, 86, 87 millimeter bore engine you're gonna to start to hear that piston make some noise. It's gonna start getting some piston slap. And somewhere below 3,000 piston wall clearance, you're gonna present the opportunity where the piston can stick in the bore. So generally these pistons and most import engines are gonna be three and a half to 4,000 piston wall clearance. If you're dealing with a box forge piston or an FSR piston because the piston has a certain amount of ovality to it as it warms up to temp, you may have an increased clearance. So if your buddy has a full round piston and you have a FSR piston, you may have different clearances on the same bore size and the manufacturer has taken into account how that material grows as it comes up to temperature. Now, because this engine is gonna be naturally aspirated, I've chosen to use a 4032 forging, which is a low expansion forging, so it should have less growth as it comes up to temp. It is a harder forging, so it's more likely to crack if you detonate it. But again, naturally aspirated engine, 4032 is gonna be a plenty strong piston and it's gonna be a low noise piston. So it'll be a quiet little engine that shouldn't have any oil consumption issues. As you move into having a lot of boost or nitrous, that's when you're more likely to end up with a 2618 piston, which will have more clearance and it will have more noise associated with it and the potential for oil consumption because that's what you get into with the higher expansion alloys. So again, naturally aspirated, tight clearance on the piston wall. It's gonna be around three thousandths of an inch, which is gonna be just fine. It'll be a quiet engine that should not use oil. So in order to measure piston wall clearance, you're gonna to need to get the right tools. You're gonna to need an inside mic and an outside mic. You cannot do this job correctly with a ruler, a tape measure, a set of calipers, anything like that. You need proper micrometer in order to get the right measurement. And when you're getting the right measurement, you have to be measuring the piston in the correct spot. Down here at the bottom of the skirt is one measurement. Up here at the top of the crown is a different measurement. At the top of the crown, it's over 160,000 smaller in diameter than it is down here on the skirt. That's because the top of the piston is gonna grow with heat. So when you've seen videos or you've had someone tell you that you have a lot of piston wall clearance because the piston will rock in the bore, it's not an accurate way to measure it. It tells you nothing. You're not any smarter if you rock a piston in the bore. It's, it's 
no, of no value. In order to know the piston to wall clearance, you need to determine where it is on the piston you're gonna be measuring, and you're gonna have the correct tools to measure it. So SuperTech calls out a gauge point, and that is 866 thousandths from the bottom of the oil expander ring. So we're gonna measure that, and we're gonna mark the piston in the spot that we're gonna be measuring. Now that we've determined what size the piston is, we need to see how big the cylinder bore is. But because we're using an aluminum block, we're gonna use a torque plate. Torque plate is a fixture that you bolt onto the block and it gives access to the cylinders while simulating the workload or force and deflection that a cylinder head presents to the engine block. So the cylinders will be egg-shaped or barrel-shaped without a torque plate. And when you put the torque plate on there, they kind of straighten up and the block was honed and bored with a torque plate. So we're gonna put the torque plate back on in order to understand how round the bores are with the cylinder head bolted on and what the piston wall clearance will be with the torque plate on the block, again, simulating the cylinder head. Uh, we'll check ring gaps at the same time because these engines move around quite a bit more than say a cast iron block like a 2JZ. So I've got a Speed Factory head stud kit I'm gonna put a head gasket on in between the torque plate and the block so I don't mess up the surfaces there. And then we can measure the cylinder bores. When I install the head studs, I just spin them in by hand. There should not be any friction in the threads. If the threads in the block are not clean and you're having trouble installing the studs, stop and get a chase tap. You do not wanna be removing materials so you won't use a conventional tap. You'll use a chase tap, which basically is just gonna straighten the threads out without removing material. I also put a little bit of anti-seize on the threads going into the block because they're materials that some sort of lubrication needs to be present on the threads. Lastly, this is an L19 stud. So it's susceptible to uh, hydrogen embrittlement, which if you get water on the fastener, it can actually deteriorate and break. So L19 is a neat material, however, it must be cared for. You don't leave it uh, unlubricated, you don't leave it out in the elements, and you do not get water on them. So you don't use an L19 fastener on something that has a water passage in the head stud hole. It doesn't work out, but that's not how this block is. So with this block, this material is just fine, but again, you, you have to care for it during the process of insulation. installed the torque plate onto the block and run the fasteners down with my fingertips. And now I'm gonna to torque this up to the specified 90 foot pounds in three equal steps in the sequence that you would torque the cylinder head down. So after we've done that, we've simulated the cylinder head on the block and it's okay to measure the bores. set my outside mic to the diameter of the piston at the gauge point. So I'm gonna put the outside mic in the vise, zero out the inside mic, and then the difference between what I have here and what I have there is my piston wall clearance. So it's worth noting that when I measure the engine cylinder, 
from the intake side of the engine to the exhaust side of the engine, I get right at 3000s. But when I measure the cylinder front to back, I get just under 3000s. So there's about three ten thousandths of an inch of egg in this block. Now, because the supporting material on one side of the cylinders is different than the other sides of the cylinders, with most aftermarket honing equipment, you're gonna get some egg or taper, and it's not, it's not pretty, it's not ideal, but this is the world we live in, and there's some level of acceptance that you have to have when you measure these components. Now, if it had a thousandth of egg or taper, we're gonna call that not good enough. And if this was an iron block, or if it had heavy aftermarket sleeves in it, then you could get down to where you have very minimal, if any, egg or taper in the block. But this is a factory casting, and you have to allow for some movement in the material during its operation. So if you get really caught up in a few ten thousandths of an inch in this process, you need to imagine that once this engine is up to temperature, it's again going to change shape because it doesn't have the same amount of material around all of the cylinder. So it's gonna grow up and out in different directions. So if you get really super critical about this part not having a dead set zero tolerance for error measurement, then you're not imagining what it's like during operation and you need to be more flexible in your thought because it is not perfect, nor will it be perfect when it's 200 degrees or nor will it be perfect when it's 200 degrees at the top of fourth gear after you've run it through the gears because things are gonna change with heat. Since I already have the torque plate on the block, I'm gonna go ahead and measure the piston ring gap. Now piston ring gaps are one of the very few things that you have total control over during the process of building the engine because someone else has done the machine work. So when you measure the piston ring gap, it's important that you allow for some thought on how it happens and how it comes up. If the ring gap is too small, the rings will butt, and when they butt, they're gonna change shape or bend, and then the engine cylinder will not seal up anymore and the engine will have to come back apart. So having the ring butt is a very bad thing to do. If the ring gap is a little bit larger than ideal, it's not gonna be a situation where all of a sudden the engine has tremendous blow by and, and now it's this problematic engine. So allow yourself some tolerance there. The aftermarket rings and aftermarket pistons are gonna have a much larger gap than what's specified in the OEM service manual. So do not look at the OEM service manual when it comes time for this part of the build. You wanna follow the manufacturer specifications that created the pistons and created the rings and they're gonna give you a starting point. Now, for example, with an engine that sees a lot of boost, you'll have a larger ring gap than what is specified if you're dealing with budding. So in my experience with the 2JZ, if I ever got a cylinder hot, I would butt that ring and I'd have to go up, go back in the next revision of that engine and open it up a couple thousandths of an inch or a few thousandths of an inch. And I've ended up with some pretty big ring gaps on a fairly small bore engine. And the crankcase vacuum or crankcase pressure doesn't change dramatically. The blow by doesn't change dramatically. So don't get really hung up on a very low value here. Hone finish is gonna create or, or negate a lot of blow by, whereas ring gap isn't that huge of an influencer. So this set of pistons, we're looking for around 15 thousandths of an inch on the top ring. And I would say three to four thousandths larger on the second ring because whatever gaskets by the top ring, you don't want it trapped between the top ring and the second ring because then it can cause the rings to flutter. Combustion will get past the top ring. If it gets past the top ring, you want it to get past the second ring as soon as possible. So you make the second ring gap larger than the top ring gap. So we'll end up with say 15 thousandths on the top ring. And if we're 18 or 20 on the second ring, I'll be just fine with that. We're gonna put a little bit of light oil in the bore. So the ring has something to slide on. And we can put this second ring down in the bore and use the piston to square it up. Now this is quite a bit easier with the torque plate off, but because the block changes shape a lot, I'm just gaining a point of reference. 
as delivered without any filing, I have 19 thousandths on the second ring and 15 thousandths on the top ring. And I have a piston wall clearance that lines up with the specification sheet. So I know that the cylinder bore is the right size. If you're getting a situation where you take the rings out of the box and you're getting a much larger than desired gap, again, it's time to look at that bore size because if the bore is any increment larger than the spec sheet, then you're gonna get a exponentially larger ring gap. On the small rings that go on the oil expander, you just wanna make sure that there's at least 15 thousandths of a gap on the oil expander rings. Very rarely you'll have a boxing issue or a problem where you have far too large of a ring gap out of the box with the right size cylinder, or you could run into a situation where the oil expander is narrow and it needs to be opened up. These are a little bit trickier to file because they're so thin, but they can be filed uh, with a lot of patience. And when you're done filing rings, and we have a separate video that we can link to on filing rings, but you wanna make sure that anywhere on any of these components, you don't, you're not able to catch a fingernail. So I've noticed on one of these pistons, at the bottom of the piston, there's, a, there's enough of an edge that I'm gonna just take a piece of thousand grit sandpaper and just take that edge off because as that piston changes shape in the bore, you don't wanna be scratching the cylinder block as the piston rocks around in the bore. So while you're touching all these parts during this process, you're feeling them with your fingertips and making sure that you don't have any raised metal edges or metal that's been rolled over during machining because all those things will create problems once you have a running engine. So we've measured our piston wall clearance. We've measured the bearing clearance on the bottom end. We've checked the ring gap. So the next step is washing all these parts up and getting them clean enough to assemble. So I know that there's a lot of work leading up to this point and you just wanna build the engine, but I assure you that these steps breed for a successful engine program and that they're worthwhile, they're worth the time. It's the, it's the lengthy, not so fun part, but it ensures the success of the engine. So thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time. Thank you.